Brendan, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast, my brother. What's up, man? It's good to be here. I didn't know you could stream live on Facebook from Zoom while recording, so I need to get my team to talk to your team to learn. <laughs> yeah, you can. And what Brendan's talking about, for those of you listening, is I'm streaming live to the Keto Camp Academy. They get exclusive access to these interviews. So we'll definitely talk about that. Zoom is pretty cool. You're able to do a lot of cool things. So Very right good. on, dude. I, I'm, I'm, I love you, dude. I, I just want to say it right from the start. I got so much love and appreciation for this man right here. Uh, he's been a mentor to me for so many years throughout my, my functional diagnostic nutrition journey as an FDN practitioner. And now we're, we're really close friends. We're learning from each other and I'm learning so much from you. So I'm so excited to have this conversation, which is long overdue. We're already in the episodes in the 60s by the time your episode comes around. So it's long overdue. And before we get into all the cool things that you're up to, let's talk about who you were back in your teenage days. Like, how did you get into the health space? I'd love for you to go as deep as you'd like. So go ahead. The floor is yours, brother. Hey, thanks, man. You know, first and foremost, it, it really is an honor. And I, I would say this is very overdue. Um, but the reality is, dude, you're out there hustling and doing so much amazing work. I'm out there hustling, doing so much amazing work. And that's where, you know, we both hit that point of like, all right, let's get you scheduled on my podcast and vice versa, because we just, you know, but that's how it all works, right? You know, we're all students of life together. We're all here to learn together. We're all here to elevate one another. And so that's where you know, human health and everything is way too complex and multifaceted for one person to be able to do it all. And that's where these like minded um, professionals need to be, you know, getting together to cultivate that energetic resonance throughout the universe. But um, gosh, where to start? Um, yeah, so feel free to just ask whatever questions. But in a nutshell, you know, I started my career when I was kind of like 17, 19. It started with, uh, you know, scrubbing toilets at a gym, selling supplements at GNC, you know, and then enter personal training, nutrition coaching. And then it was more like holistic health and fitness coach. And then it was more like, well, FDN practitioner. And now it's more, you know, functional medicine consultant and national clinical lecturer. So I don't even know what's going on anymore, but it's been a ride for sure. Yeah. So you started off when you were a teenager and you got into the fitness scene. You were, you were and you still are, you're, you're a really fit guy. Uh, I'd love to start there. Like, what's the difference yeah. between somebody who has goals to have a lot of strength and performance and perform at a high level as an athlete and versus somebody who has a goal for health and longevity? Is there a separation there? Yeah. And that's what's really fun for me because uh, I always knew like really what I wanted to do to do and, and what I was really passionate about from a professional service was more like I wanted to run lab testing, to help people reach their health goals ultimately, you know, and that's kind of the whole thing. However, um, it's been interesting because as I've spanned that huge gap of like, okay, fitness and bro science and protein shakes and weights or whatever, um, all the way to now lecturing to medical doctors, naturopaths around the country and whatever, um, there's so much in between and it's this whole spectrum. And so that's where, you know, certainly in today's age, there are almost kind of two different camps, but then it's all under the umbrella of holistic health and fitness where, okay, there's still a lot of just like fitness people and bro science and this attitude of, uh, you know, okay, I need to get in shape and I will get healthy while getting in shape. And, uh, you know, I don't see it that way. I, you, you have to get healthy to be able to get in shape. And, you know, it, it's not definitive. People are, oh, so are you saying like, don't work out hard and like, just focus on, well, it's all the above, right? And that's obviously where catering the exercise regimen to your current state of physiology. Um, but that is kind of a just taboo misconception or whatever, where, you know, people have this idea of fitness equals health or fitness before health or fitness to get to health. And uh, I don't think it is that way. It's like, well, we have to be focused on building health and an appropriate fitness regimen is certainly a component of that much bigger picture. Yeah, 100%. Fitness is important. It's one of the pieces to the puzzle, but it's not the biggest piece. It's, it's, but it's an important piece because they're mm -hmm. all pieces to a health puzzle that we have to get together and, and put together. Uh, so you're, you're t totally right about that. And you are doing a lot of cool things, lecturing to medical doctors. I mean, how, how does that, a boy growing up in Kansas who has dreams to put a dent in disease, mm -hmm. how does it feel when you're on stage 
able to share and lecture to a group of medical doctors? What does that feel like? I mean, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very transparent of like, look, I don't have a college degree because like I, you know, started fitness and nutrition and I knew like functional medicine, which I do that because functional medicine is this extremely popular thing right now. And all the while, like there's no such thing as a doctor of functional medicine. That he's doing, he's doing air quotes if you can't see this. Yeah. Listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, anybody that is like, well, I'm a doctor and I, I, I'm a functional medicine doctor. Okay. Well, they're not a doctor of functional medicine. They are some kind of licensed doctor, whether that's a chiropractor or maybe they just have a PhD in English, but then they're a doctor that claims to practice functional medicine. So yeah, my point being there, you know, there is no standard of education in that field. Now, what I see though, is in the functional medicine world, you know, I was really bummed. I wanted to come see you in Florida. I was down in, um, I don't know. I flew into Fort Lauderdale. So wherever I was somewhere around there. Um, but it was one of those in and out, but I was lecturing to primarily it was medical doctors that were there at this A4M thing. And, um, what I basically see is I think the functional medicine, the functional health, holistic health movement is really going to be led by the millennial generation. You know, I think this kind of functional medicine thing that's exploding, it's not the medical doctors that are trying to turn more holistic, trying to turn more functional. You know, it's a generational thing. You know, they're, they're going to keep moving forward. They might try to step into this new territory but this movement is a millennial movement, you know, and millennials will make up 75% of the workforce by 2025. That's a cool statistic that I got out of a corporate meeting at the Association of Naturopathic Physician, you know, things. So they did this market research to show that. And so what we're seeing actually was interesting. Enrollment into naturopathic medical school is going down, 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 you know, and, and, you know, you've got all these medical doctors. It's like functional medicine is almost this rat race, but it's this completely unmonopolized industry. And so it's just this free for all. And that's where being a guy, I, I do actually think I have a lot of valuable insight because having started as just a personal trainer and then lecturing to medical doctors, I see the full spectrum and I see all the errors because there are still a lot of fitness professionals out there that they focus way too much on exclusively fitness and silly, you know, sensationalized diet stuff. But then on the other side of that spectrum, uh, there's not nearly enough talk about fitness in functional medicine. You know, I go to all the big conferences, I speak at all the big conferences, and nobody's talking about exercise and fitness as part of functional medicine. And that's where you know, I think FDN is more intelligent with FDN takes that, well, holistic health, environment, lifestyle, supplementation, allopathic measures when needed, you know, and that's kind of the FDN umbrella. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a total mess, to be honest, and very inconsistent in this whole industry. It is. And, and you mentioned holistic a few times there, and you are known as the holistic savage. Speaking of which, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm wearing a t-shirt, hashtag holistic savage here that you sent me. So thank you for the shirt. Yeah, it looks Where good did, on you. Thank you, dude. Where did you get this, uh, this moniker from, the holistic savage? Yeah, well, honestly, it was when um, I got on Instagram. You know, I, I don't like, um, I don't know, I don't want to go into a tangent on social media because ultimately social media is a tool. Now, what you do with that tool and whether that's constructive or destructive, that's up to you. But with that said, um, if you're a millennial, if you're a business owner, if you're an entrepreneur and you're not using social media, I mean, you are just horribly missing out. So I finally stepped up my social media game. I was getting on Instagram, starting to grow a following, starting to put myself out there more and be a little bit more transparent, more vulnerable. You know, you got to put yourself out there if you want something to happen. And um, as I got started, you know, I was trying to find my vibe of like, what am I trying to communicate to the world via Instagram? And, you know, certainly with all the fitness stuff, I didn't want people looking at me or looking at my workout videos. I didn't want people thinking of me as a bodybuilder. You know, it's, it, I'm not bashing that demographic. I'm just saying like, that's not me. I'm, I'm not a meathead. I'm not 
Mr. Bodybuilder, even though I've done five bodybuilding shows and never got less than second place, you know, but like, I'm so much more than that. And so I was really trying to determine like, how do I explain the aura that is me, that is something that people can identify with and relate to. And, you know, my whole goal is to elevate the vibrations and the consciousness and the awakening of this world and all move us towards a more uh, healthy and holistic direction for the sake of our species, the sake of our planet. So it really just kind of hit me one day of like, uh, you know, it's, it's a yin yang, you know, we all have the yin yang of our soul and we have our different characteristics that make up our unique aura. And so it just really hit me. I was like holistic savage because everybody loves to say, Oh, you're such a savage. And that's like a hot thing these days and holistic and, it just, uh, it just hit perfectly. And fortunately, nobody else had thought of that. And so I kind of locked it down. I was like, oh, I'm the holistic savage. And so now that's kind of become its own brand, its own lifestyle, its own movement. And uh, it's exciting to see where that goes. Yeah, it's fun. I, I love that name. So check, check them out on Instagram. Uh, you have, do you have two accounts on Instagram or just one now? I do. It's, it's a little messy and things are growing faster than I can keep up with. So it's like the holistic savage as of now is kind of my personal Instagram. And then I have a metabolic solutions LLC Instagram that I'm not super active on. We're, we're hiring a social media manager right now to kind of get that whole situation under control so we can deliver more valuable content. You know, one thing I'll be very transparent I've been using my profile more as like a personal profile and I share what I like sharing. Um, but I want to really make a shift of like, well, my goal is to give the world a lot of valuable content. And so rather than just posting about my life, but that's where I need help with it. So the goal for, as we move it in 2020 is, um, getting things under control so we can continue to use these platforms, um, you know, as a conduit for delivering free, valuable metabolic science and psychological, you know, the whole, the whole spectrum of healing, you know? Yeah. And you, you nailed it when you said it's a tool that could either help you and and help you help more people, or it could hurt you. It could consume you, consume you. So it really depends on, are you using the tool or is the tool using you? Because it's a double edged sword. And you're right. Also, when you said that if you are in this day and age and you have a business and a message and you're not using this tool, then you're not going to be able to make the impact that you want. So it's a slippery slope that can be done the right way. And it sounds like you're doing the right way by hiring a team and, and just sharing what you're learning. And that's kind of how I do it as well. I share what I learn, which, which also helps me absorb more of that information, which you know, all about that. I I, I heard you on a podcast as I was studying you a little bit more, but getting ready for our our podcast interview, you were talking about having this self-awareness to when your vibration shifts away and you become more introverted, mm-hmm. uh, you, you shift back to uh, more of an extroverted state. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you, you notice your energy shifting and you kind of go into the shells, kind of what you said. So can you explain a little bit more about that? When does it typically happen and what do you do to get yourself back out there? Yeah, you know, um, it's been a crazy ride and, and there's definitely kind of this movement of awakening going on in the world today. And, and I think with internet and social media, uh, it's kind of causing this divide because everybody's finding their camps. Everybody's finding their tribes because we're all connected around the world through this platform, you know, so then your, your vibe tracks your tribe, both on an existential level and also just a technological level. I mean, that's what, you know, social media does. Oh, you like Ben Greenfield. You might also like Ben and Brendan, you know what I mean? So, um, but with that said, yeah, I, I, with my, my life, You there? I think we broke up. Professional business have to be very diverted today and, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, really, it's just one of those things. I try to be very conscious and self-aware always. And I'm always introspecting. and I'm always kind of paying attention to my energy because, you know, if you're not taking care of yourself and you're not cultivating your, your inner vibration, um, you can't serve the best of your ability. And so that's where if I feel like I'm getting really worn out, uh, you know, I'm trying to take that time to recharge so I can put my best foot forward. So certainly it's a self-awareness and knowing, you know, I think if you're in this field, you're an empath and you're uh, a giver, right? And so certainly you're filling everybody else's cup from your soul pitcher and 
hey, you got to got to fill your own cup before you can pour that water into others. So I just try to be conscious of that as much as I can. Yeah. Soul pitcher. I've never heard that before. I like that term. Did, did you break up on your end or was it just my end? Did, did the internet connection break up on your end? Uh, it's a little, a little glitchy, but it seems to be all right. Okay. Let's keep this train going. So you mentioned um, a couple things. You went from a personal trainer, similar to me, to now lecturing and you're in the holistic health space, which is a very general term. What, what, is, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've made as a practitioner over the years that you learned from? Uh, could you share one or two of those things? Yeah, you know, honestly, the very first thing that comes to mind is uh, overcomplicating everything. You know, it's funny how... Um, when I first really, really got into the space, it's all about general principles, like when you're a personal trainer, you there? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. You froze on my end. So you could, you could oh, start, start that over again if you don't mind. Yeah, no, not at all. It just kind of rebooted, but I think we're good. Um, Dum, da, da, dum. I was just saying how uh, I think everything's gotten way too overcomplicated, you know, with uh, technology, there's the the paralysis by analysis that I think is plaguing everybody. And, um, you know, one thing I find kind of difficult is like, I'm, I'm so far down the rabbit hole of my world and what I'm teaching people. So sometimes, you know, conveying that to the consumer, conveying that to the, the average person off the street. Uh, there's such a huge education gap, you know, from standard American to, you know, all the complexities that are kind of holistic health and functional medicine. But at the end of the day, it doesn't need to be so complicated. And that's where, um, you know, people kind of are listening to experts within certain areas. Like, obviously, you know, you're a keto expert, you know, me, you know, mold microbes methylation is kind of my big area of clinical, clinical expertise. Um, but the thing is we need more general application, you know, it's cause it wouldn't, I don't think it would be constructive for, let's say somebody of their, um, like hyper monitoring their state of ketosis and freaking out about, I have some mold toxins trapped somewhere in my body. And if they're hyper focused on that, while well, meanwhile, they don't have the foundations in place, you know, they're not filtering their water or their air, they're rubbing aluminum deodorant on every day, they're uh, working too much and stressing themselves out, not making time. So it's like the general principles of health building are the most powerful and yet the least talked about and kind of the least sexy. We love to, uh, I think humans are amazingly intelligent and we've never had so much information readily available all the time. And of course, we think that there's that like magic formula and it keeps going like the rabbit hole of science of, oh, well, surely there's like this biological metabolic scientific reason. And if we just dig, 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 dig. And it's like, honestly, the vast majority of the time, the reason somebody's not getting results is they're not regularly practicing the fundamentals, you know, enough. So it's kind of my first thought. Yeah. Great tip. You're, you're right. I mean, we could go really deep into mycotoxins and, and, uh, yeah. infected root canals and all that. But if you don't have the basics, uh, that's where we would start. So what are some more basics? You mentioned filtered water, uh, making sure your deodorant is organic, uh, aluminum free. What are some other things you can share? Yeah, you know, I always start uh, and this was, you know, I, I lectured for a total of like five hours this past weekend. But that was kind of what I was trying to get across too. is like, all right, we got to start with the fundamental. And that's, again, kind of to the point of where I think, you know, FDN is a superior methodology compared to just what is generally called functional medicine is it is this more holistic broad approach where you know the diet the rest the exercise stress reduction supplementation that we all get trained on um but so could, could you real quick just explain what fdn is because there's some listeners thinking what is fdn right now? oh totally so functional diagnostic nutrition uh is you know the certification and, and methodology for functional practitioners and you know, obviously you're certified and I'm the director of that community. And, uh, you know, certainly that, that is one piece of my professional life. And I'm, I'm very proud to be, you know, part of that organization. And, um, I think as an umbrella methodology, um, I don't see any other 
schools kind of teaching it in that way because we really focus on, okay, I mean, it's like a clinical holistic health coach, right? It's um, a, a professional that understands complex metabolic science and knows how to interpret complex functional lab tests for the sake of a holistic health building program and a more health coaching building model because you know we can't just have it be like okay the practitioner the clinician the doctor you know walk in oh take a glance at the labs and okay because the where functional medicine is going wrong conventional medicine you know running conventional lab tests and treating conventional lab tests with synthetic pharmaceuticals okay well there's a place for that but then functional medicine is kind of becoming not much better sometimes where it's like well now we're running functional tests and we're treating the functional test with functional supplements. And it's like, guys, that's still not the problem. It's chronic. The chronic disease epidemic is a lifestyle and environment driven epidemic. Therefore, lifestyle and environment need to be the fundamental interventions we apply the majority of our energy to. Supplements as needed, you know, supplement protocols as needed, medication, surgery as needed. But you know, it's the lifestyle and the environment, and so. I think the environmental toxicity and radiation are the first two things that everybody needs to focus on, you know, with um, cutting down the radiation with the EMF and the, you know, the 5G and all these um, non-ionizing radiations that are driving proxy nitrite and cellular oxidative stress and inflammation, and then all the toxins. So, you know, I think detoxing our environment as much as possible living a detoxification, we're cutting down on the radiation. And then we get into the lifestyle, which is all the nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress management, all that stuff. I love it. Yeah. So there's always a cause and an effect. There's not just an effect that just shows up out of nowhere. So you just illustrated that. Let's get into some cool stuff here. Sure. A lot of my audience and a lot of the members of the Keto Camp Academy who are watching right now are women. Uh, mm -hmm. Not all, but a good chunk of them. Yeah. And a lot of women are, are focused on weight loss. They're focused on losing 10 pounds, 50 pounds, sometimes 100 pounds. What are some practical tips that you can share right now for women, specifically the women, who can help them get healthier and, and drop some extra pounds? What would mm -hmm. you tell them? Absolutely. You know, certainly, you know, 30, 40 year old women have made up the majority of my clients my whole career. Uh, you know, they, they are more health conscious, they're more health education hungry, you know, they care more about their health. And usually they're the moms and the wives and they're kind of in charge of health for the family. It's not usually the dads and the men that are leading the health building practices for families. It's just, you know, it's, and that's changing, but it, we're not there yet. So, you know, with women, uh, the majority of 30, 40, 50 year old women today are all suffering from a lot of hormone imbalances, a lot of GI dysfunction, um, and really a lot of like weight loss resistance and, and weight gain that is really being driven a lot by um, stress and toxins and uh, just a lot of inflammation and GI. So, you know, certainly we could talk all day about, um, you know, estrogen dominance being rampant and just, uh, unfortunately, I walk around and to me, it's simple because I see all the pieces of it of like, well, you're eating a standard American diet, you're trying to work out really. Hard for more on uh, healing their bodies rather than trying to whip their bodies into shape, you know, that's going to be where they get more results. Because most women, you know, what do people do when they're like, I need to get healthy, I need to lose weight, I need to get in shape or whatever you know, they start really focusing on diet and exercise, but then it becomes deprivational dieting with uh, overly intense exercise. And it's like, and, and then they're fueling the process generally out of self-loathing, because then there's the psycho-emotional component where the whole process is being funded, being fueled energetically by a sense of inadequacy, a sense of self-loathing. And so you're literally shooting yourself in the foot from the get-go with that mentality, with that outlook. Like, you know, step one, we have to fuel the health building journey um, out of unconditional self-love, which that's its own whole conversation to talk about for three hours is how to practice unconditional self-love more regularly. It's, it's not something that we just, oh, we're all very hard on ourselves. You know, we all judge ourselves very frequently. And so 
step one, let's start accepting and, and judging less harshly uh, and, you know, loving ourselves unconditionally and loving ourselves enough to have the discipline to practice self-love and, and set those boundaries. So you have to create the space for your, for yourself to heal. And then we apply the fundamental principles. And so that's the beautiful thing is the journey can be a lot easier when we shift the paradigm from, all right, you don't, it, but unfortunately the majority of like the health and fitness industry, it is kind of the marketing strategy of, are you unhappy with your health and weight? Are you unhappy with how you look? Like therefore, and that's the marketing and the sensationalism that is kind of the, the mainstream marketing. Uh, which is really, really sad because we have to start with, all right, unconditional love. And therefore, I'm going to make sleep a priority. You know, I'm going to turn that phone off. I'm going to go for a walk and watch the sunrise. I'm going to nourish my my mind, body, and soul with every decision I make on a day-to-day -day basis. And if I'm not perfect, oh, gosh, dang it, like, I, I messed up. I might as well just, you know, jump off and, and binge because I screwed up. I wasn't perfect to my diet. Like, forgive yourself a little bit. So I like to take the approach of, uh, you know, every decision you make on a day-to-day -day basis, ask yourself, like, does this nourish my mind, body, and or soul? Make the adult decision, live with the decision, love yourself enough to do what the right decisions are. But you could talk about that all day. It's such a powerful share, Brendan, because I, I preach the same message. We could give them all the tools of the trade, you know, exercise this amount of times, bring your carbohydrates here, take the supplement. But if you don't have that self-love, it's almost impossible to heal. So I love that message. It's such a powerful message. And you touched upon something. You didn't say it exactly, but I, you were referencing the whole eat less, move more movement out there, which we see a lot in the personal training space. And I'm sure you saw it. I used to teach it for so many years. The, it's such a slippery slope and it's such a distraction from what really matters. And what really matters is what we're talking about here. But it's a slippery slope because if somebody starts to cut their calories and exercise more, they are going to get some results initially. And they're going to think, yeah, this is the way to do it. And then all of a sudden, they're going to hit a plateau and they're going to think that they're just not exercising enough. When the mm -hmm. answer is having some self-love, maybe having an extra hour of sleep, uh, these are more important long-term than some short-term results. So can you just piggyback off of that and what you've seen in that eat less, move more movement? Oh, totally. You know, and certainly we could talk for hours on uh, law of thermodynamics and then all the factors that play into that of, you know, what causes, because, you know, that's a, that's the thing, like, I, I require, it takes a lot of calories to keep this going. And sometimes when I'm uh, out, you know, with colleagues and whatever. Yeah. You know, I get all, all these women colleagues kind of looking at me like, I wish I had your metabolism. I wish I could eat that much. And it's just like, you know what, like you're assuming that I have this glorious metabolism. That's just a raging fire. Um, but you know, let's, if we break down the lifestyle choices and we break down the science, like that's, that's a false projection. That's, that's a false assumption that you're projecting onto me. Cause the reality is, you know, people don't need to be eating less, they need to just be eating real food, you know what I mean? Like, it, the, the problem is not people are overeating per se, they're just overeating the wrong things. Like it's, it's, that's where like, uh, back in the day, I hit this point where um, I was so tired of neurotically logging my food and counting my macros and calories, because I, you know, anybody that gets into the space at some point, you are weighing everything you eat. Um, and I just got so sick of, I had such a tumultuous relationship with food and I was just like, you know what, screw it. Like, let me just get back to the basics and make my life a little easier. So I just made the rule of like, you're going to eat whatever you want, whenever you want, as much as you want. Uh, but just a few basic rules of like rule number one has to be real food, nothing processed period. You know, so if you want to eat five bananas, eat five bananas. If you want to eat a pack of bacon, eat a pack of bacon. But the point being, start listening to your body, like make that first rule that has to be real food. And that's where, I don't know, people get into the, well, that's not realistic to never eat anything processed or whatever. And it's like, I don't know if, if you say it's not realistic, then yeah, your brain is going to get wired to believe that it's not realistic. So I, I just, it, it all comes back to the mind though. The mind is the most powerful thing in the body and we can shape it and sculpt it just like we can shape and sculpt our biceps, but people don't look at it that way. 
we need to shape our neuroplasticity. We need to challenge our belief system. What's the story that we're telling ourselves that's holding us back from accomplishing something that's very simple. So, you know, when somebody is, well, you know, do you think I should do keto, paleo, whole 30, Mediterranean, uh, you know, intermittent fasting, da, 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 you know, all these diets. And it's like, how about we start with self-awareness and self-love and eating real food? You know, let's, let's start drinking water. Let's start eating real food from the earth. Let's start sleeping more. Let's start, you know what I mean? So I don't know, people overcomplicate it. <laughs> they do. And it's just a big distraction. That's what it is. Counting your calories. It's a big distraction from what mm -hmm. really matters. I, I believe calories yeah. uh, matter, but they do. I, don't I don't think they're important, which we just talked about that. So yeah, you said that so well, dude, I, I'm 100% agree with that. Uh, I'd love to talk about the relationship between inflammation and when I say inflammation, cellular inflammation mm -hmm. uh, and weight loss resistance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in my uh, lecture last Friday, um, you know, because lecture mold microbes methylation, you know, and, and that's great. Uh, that's, that's my clinical area of focus. But I kind of started the lecture by backing up of like, all right, well, so we've established like the, the healthcare spectrum needs to be environment lifestyle kind of the the more you know functional supplementation if you will you know for, uh pharmaceuticals surgery you know surgery kind of being that final safety net and you know so to me that is the healthcare spectrum but that's not our healthcare system right now unfortunately um but with that said you know inflammation is so what drives disease you know what what um metabolic uh you know, progressions cause disease. Well, ultimately inflammation, oxidative stress, you know, those are two, the, the two great plagues of human metabolism. They go hand in hand when there's oxidative stress, there's inflammation. When there's inflammation, there's oxidative stress. So, you know, those are the, the destructive processes that lead towards disease. So then it's like, okay, great. You know, so I think having some kind of objective assessment of to what degree do you have inflammation? To what degree that you have oxidative stress? And that's where testing stuff comes in. So then once we have an idea of how inflamed you are, how much oxidative stress do you have going on in your body right now? Because the disease is the end product. So, you know, autoimmunity, which um, I guarantee you, like, let's say there were, you know, 50 women in your group watching this right now between the ages of 30 and 40, and they're unhappy with their health probably the majority of them have autoimmunity going on in their bodies right now. And, and I don't say that to sound scary and auto it's autoimmunity isn't something you do or don't have, you know, if you have an autoimmune disease, well, you have autoimmune activity going on just because you haven't been diagnosed. You know, that's the, by the time it gets diagnosed, you've already had autoimmunity going on for probably at least five to 10 plus years. A lot of times it's much longer. Can so you break that down? What exactly, for those who don't know what autoimmune is, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, so autoimmunity is kind of this recognized process of, oh, well, the body's immune system is attacking and destroying our own tissues. You know, it's, we are immune, uh, having this immunological reaction to ourselves, that auto, autoimmune. And so there's a lot of different mechanisms that drive that. But ultimately, it's, it's a... Um, you know, a gut health dysfunction, a uh, microbial imbalance, and a toxin-driven phenomena. And, you know, the two main mechanisms, molecular mimicry and bystander effect, aka, you know, and that's, we don't, we don't need to get lost in the weeds of science, but there is a trigger that's confusing the immune system. Now, obviously, the immune system doesn't get confused. It's just when there's this molecular mimicry of like, well, this, uh, this thyroid tissue looks a lot like, you know, this, this bug protein or this gluten protein. And, you know, we've got leaky gut. And so we have all these foreign invader proteins and stuff. And, oh, well, so we need to attack that thing. But then the, the missiles being blasted can't distinguish between, well, that's a bug and that's our own tissue. They, they just both kind of get destroyed. And so that's like a very, very simplified kind of explanation of what autoimmunity is but um yeah i'm sure a lot of the people listening probably have some autoimmune activity going on yeah and you said something uh on another podcast that i was listening to and you compared uh heart disease cancer and then mm -hmm. autoimmune could you share that again what you shared on that podcast if you remember what you shared in that podcast yeah 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's kind of crazy. If you added up all the cases of autoimmunity going on in the U.S., uh, there's more autoimmunity going on than uh, cancer. It would outrank cancer as far as kind of disease prevalence. But the difference from a statistic evaluation is, you know, all types of cancer are kind of statistically represented by one bucket that is cancer, whereas autoimmunity, every disease is kind of looked at separately of celiac that's different than rheumatoid and Sjogren's and MS and whatever else. But when you add up all the occurrences of autoimmune disease diagnosis, it actually outranks cancer. So, you know, our top three killers and our top three diseases are, are, you know, well, top four, I should say is, you know, we've got the heart disease, the autoimmunity, the cancer, the diabetes, metabolic syndrome, but really it's, it's a lot of the same root cause driving mechanisms. And again, it gets back to that toxic and radioactive environment with the horribly toxic dysfunctional lifestyle of standard America you know, and, and then we're trying to cut and uh, pharmaceutical our way out of that. And it's like, well, that's why statistics keep getting worse. Yeah, they do. It, it, and it's, it's sickening. And, and we're, we're set out to put a, a big dent in that. And we are, and we will continue to do so. Autoimmune is, is a serious thing. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of people, I don't think a lot of people understand it, really. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned a few, uh, MS, um, you have Hashimoto's, which is, what is it? Uh, 80, 80 or 90 percent of hypothyroidism yeah. is Hashimoto's I think yeah right about 80 to 90 percent of all hypothyroid cases are actually autoimmune they autoimmune just aren't evaluated properly so there's a hundred autoimmune and about additional 40 that's associated with autoimmune mm -hmm. I personally I don't think you know this but I have uh Raynaud's which is an oh, autoimmune yeah Raynaud's yeah. because I had my bucket got full from a lot of stressors just standard American diet I had uh, mercury poisoning from silver mm. fillings in my mouth for 20 years and I got it removed the right way and I'm dealing with that I'm healing the gut and it all goes back to inflammation and it all mm. goes back to the gut it's like it's yeah. a holistic approach to getting somebody's health back and once you understand this it's it's so empowering because if you're listening to this with oh my god we're just there's no chance that we're ever going to survive we have cancer diabetes and heart disease that's not the case. The, the point of this message in this conversation is that there is hope if you understand mm -hmm. it. The body is so freaking amazing. Mm -hmm. Once you start removing the interference, it will heal itself. So what yeah. me and Brendan are doing, we're talking about the interference and whatever is resonating with you, whatever you think is filling your bucket, start removing that and the body mm -hmm. is very smart. It will heal itself. Uh, you mentioned a couple of tests about, well, you didn't mention the test, but you mentioned oxidation and inflammation and mm -hmm. you mentioned testing for it. What are some of the tests that you run to determine your levels of inflammation and oxidative stress? Yeah, so ultimately, um, to also simplify it too, because it is overwhelming and scary to talk about all the disease stuff and, and rampant. Um, and that's where to make it simple, like, okay, well, you know, inflammation, oxidative stress, that drives all disease. But then, so what's triggering the, the, uh, the oxidative stress and inflammation? And really the, the three major things, and again, this is secondary to focusing your efforts on environment and lifestyle, like environment, lifestyle, that's the base of the pyramid. Um, but if you are actively working on the base of the pyramid or you have a solid foundation already, and you know, it, it's, it's just like working out. You don't get in shape and then stay in shape if you stop working out. You have to continuously work out to stay in shape. It's the same thing with your health. So the environment and the lifestyle, it's a never ending journey. It's a never ending practice of those habits. But with that said, if you've got that solid and you have that down and you still have dysfunction, you still have disease and, and whatever. All right. So what's driving the oxidative stress and inflammation? Well, the three big ones are going to be food that's not compatible for you. And it's driving inflammation, oxidative stress, uh, bugs, AKA microbial imbalances. And not just, we're not just talking about gut microbiome, but just the microbial landscape that is in us, on us, all over us. We're, we're more bacteria. We are more microbe than human. We have way more microbes in us, on us, around us than we have human cells. And then the third one being toxins, whether those are synthetic chemical toxins like the BPA from your plastic water bottle or um, you know, heavy metals, you mentioned mercury, or then even microbial toxins, so the mycotoxins, endotoxins, exotoxins. Uh, and that's where I really focus on bugs and toxins. But yeah, food, bugs, toxins, 
you know, and you've got to have, you can't be successful dealing with those hidden stressors if you don't have the lifestyle and environment. As far as kind of different testing, um, I'm actually working with a laboratory right now on bringing a inflammation oxidative stress test to the market because as of right now, there isn't like one test that has like a really good um, marker for inflammation and oxidative stress at a low price point. That's what this test is going to be. And I'm excited about that because I think we need a low price point and functional way to kind of have our, our baseline measurement. So that way, as we're working through a health building program, we should see those numbers going down. And if they're not, then we need to dig deeper to figure out what's driving it. And that's where we do the extra testing. Because as of now, you know, my favorite way to assess for inflammation, oxidative stress are a bunch of different markers on a bunch of different tests. Because um, like C-reactive protein on, on blood chemistry, like, yeah, that's a classic marker of inflammation, but it's going to be fine for a lot of people that are horribly inflamed. So it's not a, it's not foolproof and it, it's, you know, faulty, but some of my favorites, C-reactive protein or TGF beta one, um, even just high neutrophils on a CBC could be, you know, inflammation. Um, so there's a lot of patterns that you have to look for. Um, oxidative stress, I really like. Uh, we're working on a proxy nitrite marker like 8-OHDG, uh, lipid peroxides. There's, there's a lot, but um, yeah, we'll get a new test started. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I use a lot of those tests as well. I use a test also called MetaOxy, which is a, a urine test. It's, mm. it's, uh, it's not that expensive, but it's uh, very, very useful because it's a urine test and it mm -hmm. gives you a good idea of cell membrane, specifically inflammation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's fantastic, Brendan. I, I love that. And could you explain a little bit about leaky gut? We talked about the gut and bugs uh, and these holes in your digestive tract that create an autoimmune response. Could you just, what is your definition of leaky gut and what are the top foods that cause it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and real quick, cause you mentioned the, the uh, cell membrane. So yeah, I mean, your omega-3 testing is probably one of the fun. And I, I, I don't see enough practitioners using that, but looking at the um, EPA, um, uh, arachidon, the AA EPA ratio is one of the most fundamental ways of doing the inflammation. So your arachidonic acid to EPA and, you know, measuring all of your omega three, six, nines. But, um, as far as leaky gut, you know, the, the major thing, so, you know, the basics of like, oh, you know, gastrointestinal tract, that intestinal epithelial tissue in our intestines. So we have got the inside of the tube and then we've got the mucous membrane, uh, and then we have the actual intestinal wall, the actual skin of your intestine. Uh, and that top layer just being one uh, layer of epithelial cells thick. You know, it's, it's not a lot that's protecting. You know, if you swallow dirty lake water, there's all sorts of bugs and toxins in that water. Well, it doesn't give you sepsis and poison you and kill you because, you know, we have this uh, intestinal barrier that's there to protect us, theoretically. So then when that barrier gets broken down and damaged from toxins and medications and bad bugs and inflammation, um, then yeah, it quite literally opens the door into the rest of our body for a lot of bad stuff to happen and really sets the stage for that autoimmunity. A lot of people you know, say you can't have autoimmunity without leaky gut. I don't think that's necessarily true, but yes, I would say that leaky gut is kind of the primary driver of the autoimmune mechanisms. Um, but there's a lot of things that trigger it. The things that we know immediately trigger it, you know, gluten and glyphosate are the, the two things that, you know, there's the analogy I always use is like, if I go to this door right here and I hit it with a hammer over and over and over enough, uh, eventually I'll create enough damage. I'll bust a hole through it. You know, so that's more like the, um, you know, the damaging inflammation kind of leaky gut. Uh, but that's very different than if I just walk up to the door with a key and unlock the door and open it directly. I didn't bust a hole through it by attacking it with a hammer. I just opened the damn door. And so that's where like glyphosate and gliadin or gluten to be straightforward, you know, those two compounds have been identified as, you know, they just open the door. But then there's a lot of other things, the bugs or candida or you know, other toxins and uh, medications that might be wearing down the door, wearing down the mucus barrier, wearing down the intestinal cells. Um, and, and, or, or even mycotoxins, actually, I have a good research paper that shows mycotoxins cause leaky gut immediately as well. So 
Uh, things like wheat are actually kind of a triple whammy, and that's where I think everybody, every American should be wheat free, in my opinion. Um, not everybody's gluten sensitive. I'm not saying everybody is, but regardless of sensitivity, it causes leaky gut in everybody immediately. But also wheat in our country, a um, lot of GMO, which increases the concentration of the proteins that cause the leaky gut, but then it's uh, heavily contaminated with glyphosate and other pesticides and herbicides. A lot of times there's mycotoxins with wheat. Um, so it's just... It, it just becomes a triple whammy of even if you're not gluten sensitive, even if you're not celiac, it's still just a cheap and toxic food, very inflammatory. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that the human body <laughs> is able to function with yeah. all these punches that we're taking. It's really a testament to our creator, to just the human body, the way that we were designed to be, because yeah. we're taking a lot of pun a punches these days. There hasn't been a point in time where we had so many of these stressors, these environmental stressors that you're talking about here. You have GMO wheat and just wheat in general. is It's going to mm -hmm. cause an infl inflammatory response, whether you're sensitive or not. You have corn and soybeans that are mm -hmm. loaded with pesticides and herbicides and things that are going to just wreck the gut. Then you have mycotoxins, which, are, which is mold, essentially, that you find at your Starbucks cup of coffee. Your, your Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, coffee beans are the number one sprayed crop in the world. And most of them have mold spores. They have mycotoxins. And we're drinking that every single day. Mm -hmm. And if you, don't, if you cannot methylate these toxins, if you cannot get rid of them, then they're just accumulating over time. Add a crappy diet. Add a stressful drive to work in traffic. And that's why we have this epidemic of yeah. people that are sick out there. So what me and Brendan are talking about here are the awareness, number one. Uh, number two, self-love and appreciation. And then number three, you start removing some things here and there. You, whatever resonated with you on this podcast episode, you start, maybe you're eating gluten two or three times a week and you cut that out. Uh, maybe you're drinking Dunkin' Donuts coffee and you switch over to an organic specialty grade. But these small little things that you make in your life, they add up to optimal health. And that's what we're talking about here. Anything else you want to add to that before we move on? No, I think that was that was good. Solid recap. It you know it all starts with the mind and the self belief system, and you know talked about that all day. But it's all here to start, and then we got to do the environment, the lifestyle. That's where the majority of our energy should be is focusing on our own mindset, our own self love, the our environment, our lifestyle, and then once you have that kind of going, okay, let's identify those hidden stressors. You know what are the foods that are messing you up? What are the toxins? What are the bugs? Uh, and I think we, you know, focus on it because it gets very complicated, but instead of chasing hormone imbalances or getting sold, whatever tests that you might or might not need. Okay. Well think of it as what's driving my oxidative stress and inflammation. Once I have the mindset, once I have the lifestyle and the environment a little bit more under control. And then if there's still residual inflammation, oxidative stress or, you know, pathophysiology or a diagnosis for whatever it is. Well, let's identify those key hidden stressors that are driving it. And it's basically going to be food, bugs, and toxins. So it makes the equation much more simple. Yeah, that does make it a lot more straightforward and simple. And you start with your household. You start with mm -hmm. what you have around you right now, and then you, you yes. go from there. What are some ways that you practice self-love, Brendan? You know, um, I try, you know, certainly I have quite the routine and, and lifestyle that I love. Um, and it's a balance, though, because I think, too, you know, we as a species, and this could go into a scientific tangent, but like we are wired uh, biologically to serve the greater good of our own kind. Uh, you know, that's where I like to kind of compare humans to bacteria, because first off, we are more bacteria than we are human. Um, and, you know, when you look at the psychological research, you see that, you know, loneliness is a uh, indicator of, you know, predictive all cause mortality. Loneliness is killer versus um, having a sense of self actualization, a sense of purpose helps you live longer and feel happier. So uh, that shouldn't be surprising, though, you know, because if you look at like we are a species on the face of this planet. Uh, and we are wired biologically through whatever, you know, your beliefs are on the matter, uh, but we're wired to serve and we are wired to be healthy in service. And so, you know, the idea is we, we serve each other, we have to take care of ourselves, but we're working towards the greater good of our kind. So 
it is kind of that balance of, well, fill your own cup so then you can pour into others' cups as well. So I just try to live that way. Um, but it can ha- be hard because I, I am a giver and I love giving and giving. And so sometimes I'm not great about like, oh, I need to set that boundary and turn off and unplug. But hey, man, I mean, um, my whole my whole routine in life is about health building. So my sleep is a huge priority. My food, my my fitness, my uh, meditation, spiritual practice. Like if I don't have my self-care things in place, you know, because I could talk for hours about how I eat and what my diet is, but I try to keep it simple. You know, we, we need nature. We need real food. We need love. We need reflection, you know, um, all the basic things. And I, I try to build my world around that so I can serve the world to, to my greatest capacity. Well said. You fill your cup so you could help fill others cups. I, I love yep. that. Just like the analogy with the air mask on the airplane, right? When the oxygen mm-hmm. mask dropped down, you got to let yourself breathe before you could help others. So it's exactly totally. what you just said. I have three final questions for you. Yeah. As we wrap this up, I've been really enjoying this, by the way. So me too. (laughs) What are, what's the most exciting thing that you're working on right now? Ooh, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Too many things all at once. Um, We're, we're, we already launched uh, my master course, this mold microbes methylation. It's this beast of a advanced clinical course for practitioners and doctors and all of that. Um, we've got the Holistic Savage Challenge, which is growing and we're launching it again in January. It's, you know, a, a low price point holistic lifestyle challenge. Um, the big thing though, we're, we're actually kind of, I've got all these like mini businesses and things going on, but we're forming a uh, bigger corporation as kind of the umbrella of all of it. Um, but part of that is going to be what I'm really excited about is we're starting a not-for-profit research foundation, um, which, so it's kind of crazy. We have metabolic solutions, kind of our, our client servicing, our consumer servicing, you know, virtual clinic, if you will. Um, but I really want to start this research foundation because I want to use the foundation to be able to provide people that are not financially able to access testing and supplements and all of that. I want to be able to provide them with, you know, free testing, free supplements, but we're doing it in a clinical research setting. So we're serving them while collecting data that helps us advance the field and advance our understanding on, you know, what therapeutics are especially effective for, you know, chronic disease. So, you know, the slogan of the research foundation is uh, providing, uh, you know, metabolic solutions to a world plagued by metabolic disease, something like that. I forget what I even wrote, but um, I'm really excited about that, you know, and I'm really kind of shifting my attention to um, trying to educate the world. You know, my, my whole thing is the grace most of all is teach people not to need it. So I'm really shifting my professional efforts towards traveling, lecturing, you know, putting on webinars, like just getting this information out there to the masses. So yeah, I love it. And you're doing a phenomenal job, brother. You're, you're, Thank you're changing you. the world. You, you definitely are. Where can they learn more about any of that? Uh, you have some websites for the challenge or anything like that? Yeah, we've got all the things. So we've got metabolic solutions, LC.com, which is the website where, you know, there's, there's all the things, including the holistic savage challenge and how to sign up for that or get a super cool t-shirt or whatever. Um, Instagram, the holistic savage with little underscores in between, uh, metabolic solutions, LC on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, all the things. But if you just, you know, kind of look for me- metabolic solutions or holistic savage, I would think I would pop up. Yeah, you, you do. And, and Rachel, who's our, our show notes, uh, expert, she'll put all those links in, in the podcast notes. So go check out Brendan. Uh, before we get off, I have two more, two more, uh, quick questions for you. Yeah. What is your definition of perfect health? You know, I think perfect health is uh, kind of more a matter of spiritual alignment. You know, I think perfect health is when we are in our own state of kind of nirvana and in our power. Um, you know, it's our higher self or higher consciousness that has the the hand on the wheel. You know what I mean? So certainly, you know, we've got to take care of our meat suit, our, our soul temple that is our physical being. Um, but I think perfect health is for one thing, I think perfect health is a fallacy. I think, you know, perfect health is, is a, uh, journey that never ends, but to me, perfect health in a more literal way is 
when our innermost truths are in perfect harmonious alignment with our outward actions towards the world. Uh, and so that's where I think a lot of people need help digging to uncover their innermost truths by peeling the layers of domestication that have been projected upon them since birth. And when we deconstruct who we think we are and identify who we truly are and uncover our most authentic self and uncover our most authentic truth, then we can live in alignment and all of our outward actions are in alignment with that inward truth. But first you find that inward truth. So for me, I feel I have found my innermost truths. So then the practice becomes making sure that all of my day-to-day -day words, all of my day-to-day -day actions and energetic expenditures are in perfect alignment with that truth. And I feel it if it's not, you know what I mean? Yeah, I love it. What I hear is authenticity. Are you mm -hmm. living, are you living an authentic life right there? Mm -hmm. uh, final question, Brendan, is what are you most grateful for today? Oh, gosh everything the whole you know honestly um my my personal manager and ceo caitlin roland is probably like she pops into my head right now just because um i'm truly grateful for everything and everyone that's a part of my world because uh a lot of amazing things are unfolding and and i i very much am humbled and honored with all the you know, uh, notice and, and praise I'm getting, but ultimately it's like, I couldn't do it without the amazing people around me. I have an amazing team that helps me make it all happen. And, uh, Caitlin in particular, like I could not survive without her. So I'm pretty grateful for her. She's, uh, the, the CEO of my thing now. So it's pretty cool. Awesome. Well, shout out to Caitlin. Good job, Good job Caitlin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Brendan, I want to acknowledge you for the person you are, uh, the stand you are in this world for health, for making the message known on true health and what true health is. And you are a such a smart guy. I, I was saying this before we hit the record button, but you remind me of a younger Ben Greenfield. You are so knowledgeable, so intelligent, so spiritual. You're a spiritual gangster. And I really admire you. I admire your work. And I'm grateful to call you a mentor and a friend. And I want to say thank you for the work that you're doing and for spending an hour with me and the Keto Campers. It means so much. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed this interview, brother. Hey, man. You know, I, I couldn't be more appreciative of everything you just said. Like, that means the world. And, you know, that that is what inspires me to know, like, hey, I am doing some good and I'm going to keep doing some good. So, um, but also it's reciprocated. I see everything you're doing and that's why we're so tight is, you know, we're both out there hustling to make this world a little bit better than how we came into it. And so I'm really excited to see what our paths do as we continue down our paths, you know, kind of parallel to one another. But thank you so much for having me. And dude, I can't wait to get you on my podcast. And then we'll we'll have a part two and just riff it up. I can't wait, brother. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Again. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Thank you, my man. We'll talk soon.